4. When the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and to the heads of the families and said, let us help you build because like you, we seek your God and have been sacrificing to him since the time of Ezarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the rest of the heads of the families of Israel answered, you have no part with us in building a temple to our God. We alone will build it for the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, commanded us. Then the peoples around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid to go on building. They bribed officials to work against them and frustrate their plans during the entire reign of Cyrus, king of Persia, and down to the reign of Darius, king of Persia. At the beginning of the reign of Xerxes, they lodged an accusation against the people of Judah and Jerusalem. And in the days of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Bishlam, Mephredath, Tabil, and the rest of his associates wrote a letter to Artaxerxes. The letter was written in Aramaic script and in the Aramaic language. Rehum, the commanding officer, and Shimshai, the secretary, wrote a letter against Jerusalem to Artaxerxes, the king, as follows. Rehum, the commanding officer, and Shimshai, the secretary, together with the rest of their associates, the judges, officials and administrators over the people from Persia, Uruk, and Babylon, the Alamites of Susa, and the other people whom the great and honorable Ashurbanipal deported and settled in the city of Samaria and elsewhere in Trans-Euphrates. This is a copy of the letter they sent him. To King Artaxerxes, from your servants in Trans-Euphrates, the king should know that the people who came up to us from you have gone to Jerusalem and are rebuilding that rebellious and wicked city. They are restoring the walls and the, repairing the foundations. Furthermore, the king should know that if this city is built and its walls are restored, no more taxes, tribute or duty will be paid and eventually the royal revenues will suffer. Now, since we are under obligation to the palace, and it is not proper for us to see the king dishonored, we are sending this message to inform the king so that a search may be made in the archives of your predecessors. In these records, you will find that this city is a rebellious city, troublesome to the kings and provinces, a place with a long history of sedition. That is why this city was destroyed. We inform the king that if this city is built and its walls are restored, you will be left with nothing in Trans Euphrates. The king sent this reply to Rehum, the commanding officer, Shimshai, the secretary, and the rest of their associates living in Samaria and elsewhere in the Trans Euphrates. Greetings. The letter you sent us has been read and translated in my presence. I issued an order and a search was made, and it was found that this city has a long history of revolt against kings and has been a place of rebellion and sedition. Jerusalem has had powerful kings ruling over the whole of Trans-Euphrates, and taxes and tribute and duty were paid to them. Now issue an order to these men to stop work, so that this city will not be rebuilt until I so order. Be careful not to neglect this matter. Why let this threat grow to the detriment of the royal interests? As soon as the copy of the letter of King Artaxerxes was read to Rehum and Shimshai the secretary and their associates, they went immediately to the Jews in Jerusalem and compelled them by force to stop. Thus the work on the house of God in Jerusalem came to a standstill until the second year of the reign of Darius king of Persia. Great, thanks Joel. Um, 
Oh, it's chilly this morning. It's good to see you in the building. If you need to kind of get the blood going, do a few star jumps, that's fine. I'll know what you're doing. Um, welcome if you're at home uh, in your nice, warm, comfortable lounges. Um, we're not envious at all. <laughs> Great. Do keep that passage open. Um, let me pray for us as we uh, come to God's Word. Father, sometimes uh, we hit bits in your Scripture that... Uh, are hard to hear. Maybe we're not sure what to make of them. Father, I pray that you would speak to us this morning through your words, that you would be with us. Those of us here in the building, those of us at home, Father, we pray that you would speak tender words to us as we see uh, how your plans always come up against opposition. Father, would we see the reality here, but would we leave encouraged, we ask, by your Spirit. Amen. Well, when I was five years old, um, I didn't live for much, really. Life was quite simple. I'm sure it was for you as well. Uh, but, but one of my goals in life as a five-year-old, one of, one of my joys, one of, one of the things that I would live for, one of the things that I thought was just... Yeah, th this was kind of completeness. This was the Nirvana. It was a mint choc chip Cornetto. I thought they were glorious, honestly. Now, look, hear me right, that's not the case now, so I'm not expecting deliveries. Um, my tastes are far more expensive. You can ask me later. If, you know, but, so I, I don't want a deluge of mint choc chip Cornettos, but, that, but that, as a five-year-old, I, I thought they were, they were so exotic. I mean, they were green for a start. Um, and we used to holiday in Wales uh, an awful lot because um, uh, it was cheap. Uh, and we could go to the beach all day. Um, it, didn't matter, it didn't matter if it was raining. We went to the beach. Uh, and we would play all day on the beaches in South Pembrokeshire, and it, and it was glorious. And uh, there was always a problem for my parents with small children in that we would, uh, we'd have this wonderful day on the beach but then they'd have to get us to walk up the cliff path to get back to the car park. Um, which, and as I reflect on the journey now, I mean, it was miles. Honestly, it was so far as a five-year-old, you can imagine. Um, I think it's about 300 meters, I think. I looked, you know. <laughs> and, and, but the way they used to get us up the hill, there was an ice cream van in the car park. And so I knew that at the end of this journey, at the end of this slog, this kind of trek, there would be a mint chop chip Cornetto. It was glorious. Until one day, having staggered up the cliff, carrying, well, probably nothing, because we got to the car park, and there's no ice cream van. There's no ice cream van. It's a crushing disappointment as a five-year-old when all you're living for is a mint chocolate chip cornetta. And I mean, that's not how the day's meant to go, is it? Which is a little bit like what Ezra 4 feels like, I think. I mean, so far, if we, if we kind of recap the story in chapters 1 to 3, we've seen God's people return from exile. Yeah, they, they've come back from captivity, back to their homeland, back to Jerusalem. Um, and, and, they, and they've come with such a sense of purpose and joy. They've given freely. They've got um, all the cash they need to start rebuilding. And the temple's beginning to be built. The foundations are there. They've started sacrifices again. Uh, and last time we saw, um, as, as the temple's beginning to be rebuilt, that. that people that's full of joy, they're rejoicing that the sound is heard throughout the lands. Now, there was a bit of sadness, too, as people look back at the past and realize that the temple wasn't as big or grand as it used to be, but, but the general trajectory of the story has been an upward curve, hasn't it? Here is the triumphant return. And then we get chapter 4. Uh, and it's a bit odd, isn't it? Because uh, in the midst of this narrative, uh, in the midst of this story, we suddenly get this kind of step back and, and a bigger bird's eye view of what's going on. And, 
and we get a potted thematic history that, that covers sort of like 80 years or so, all the way through to the time of Nehemiah, which is the next book in the Bible, that explains that as God's people tried to rebuild the temple, and they tried to rebuild the walls and the rest of the city, they were constantly met with opposition throughout this time, and at times it was completely helpless. You know, there are big stretches of time here you know, when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin, we've seen they turn up in verse 1, you know, they get the upper hand. And then verse 24, thus the work on the house of God in Jerusalem came to a standstill until the second year of King Darius. It all comes to an end. Like in terms of the Ezra narrative, for at least a decade, nothing happens. The enemies have the upper hand. Like imagine that. You know, it's been tough this year, hasn't it? Not meeting properly. But 10 years, if we imagine that for 10 years, that's before the London Olympics. That's how far you've got to go back to imagine a decade of time not being able to meet, nothing happening, God's kingdom not growing. The work stops. I mean, that's, that's not how it's meant to be, is it? This is the triumphant return. This is God's people coming back. This is the temple being rebuilt. This is the reestablishment of God's kingdom. And it leaves us asking questions, and I'm sure they were then. Is God really in control? Like all the time? You know, I thought God's kingdom was supposed to grow. I mean, back in chapter 1, verse 1, we see God moving the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to fulfill God's word, and, and Cyrus sends people home. So God can clearly work as he wishes. He can clearly move people's hearts. But here in chapter 4, it just seems a bit impotent. What's going on? You know, in the same way that I was meant to get a mint chop chip cornetto at the top of the hill, in the car park at the top of the cliff. You know, God's people were meant to come and rebuild the temple. It was going to be glorious. Everything was going to be perfect, right? Look, I know what you're thinking, sat there and sat at home. You're sat there waiting to hear how all this works out in the end. You know, how there's going to be a twist and the enemy's plans are foiled and everything is okay. But, but I think if we jump there, that, that would be making a mistake. I mean, if you look hard in chapter 4, like really hard, you know, there are little glimmers of hope. I mean, in verse 24, we do see that the temple is rebuilt eventually. You, know, you have to wait for the, the reign of Darius, but it does happen. Uh, and there's a little kind of glimmer in verse 21. You see, when, when Artaxerxes is saying, you know, is stopping the work on the walls later on, sort of in 60, 70 years' time, you know, he says, he issues an order to stop it. He says, you know, so that the city will not be rebuilt until I so order. You know, there's a kind of a glimmer that, you know, Artaxerxes could change his mind, and, and you know, spoiler alert, he does, Nehemiah 2. But there's not much hope here. I mean, it does work out in the end. Hear me right. You know, God is in control. He, he does overcome his enemies. Yeah, but, but that's not the point of chapter 4. That's not what chapter 4 majors on. You know, the glory actually doesn't come until next week when Richard picks up chapters 5 and 6. You'll need to come back. You know, I mean, in rugby terms... It's like I'm the big ugly forward who takes a double tackle and pops the ball up to the, uh, you know, to, for Richard, the lie is dashing back to just kind of waltz in over and score the try without getting his kit dirty. I mean, that, that's, that's kind of where we're at here. You know, I'm Ennis Genge and Richard is Anthony Watson. But, and so we have to hold on to that. We know that's coming. We know that's coming and we hold on to that truth that God's enemies are foiled, that, that God is in control. He is building his kingdom. We can't jump straight there. 
we have to pause in chapter 4. We have to face the reality. And the big lesson from chapter 4 is this. There has always been opposition to God's kingdom growing. There has always been opposition to God's kingdom growing. And we see that throughout Scripture. I mean, I mean, think of the first Good Friday. I think that would have felt a bit like Ezra 4. I mean, think about it. Less than a week after Jesus enters Jerusalem to the sound of the crowd shouting, Blessed is the King! Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord! Jesus is dragged outside the city, nailed to a cross. You have a combination of religious rulers trying to keep their status, Roman governors holding on to power and keeping the peace. Leads to Jesus being executed and his few remaining followers hiding in a room with the door locked. You know, I wonder if it's occurred to you that you're on Good Friday... Satan thinks he's won. The Son of God hangs dead on a cross. He can't save himself, the crowd sneered. Come down and save yourself if you really are the king of the Jews, they laughed. Surely that's not how it was meant to be. You can imagine Jesus' followers. What what on earth is happening? There's always been opposition to God's kingdom growing. Which is kind of timely for us, isn't it? You know, given where we're at as a church right now, what we're about to do, our motto text this year, Colossians 4, 3, pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ which I am chains with. A whole year is focused around reorienting ourselves so that we we get the message out, so that the doors open, so we can see God's kingdom grow. This year we're planning to plant a new church in Droitwich to begin a new ministry plan at Wood Green. All under that goal of seeing God's kingdom grow as families, friends and communities are transformed by the gospel. Guess what's coming, folks? Guess what's coming? There's always been opposition to God's kingdom growing. Who wants to come and church plant? (laughs) Ezra 4 is a reality check, isn't it? It's a reality check. If we think that trying to end 2021 with two healthy churches is going to be easy, fools. There's a reality check here, but at least we know what to expect. In fact, we really do know what to expect. The detail here is actually really helpful. What we have here is the enemy's playbook. We see exactly here how enemies of God are going to oppose his kingdom growing. We see here exactly how the enemies are going to attack. Look down in uh, chapter 4. The first three verses, 1 to 3, we see uh, God's enemies attack the leadership. They try to infiltrate. They come to Zerubbabel and Joshua, the heads of the family, and say, let us help you build. We'll come alongside. You know, there's a kind of a big honking clue, isn't there, where they go, you know, like you, we seek your God, and we've been sacrificing to him. They don't say he's my God. You see, they're trying to infiltrate here, try to lead them astray, distract from the task, maybe even take over the leadership. I mean, Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the rest have nothing to do with them. 
But you can see how effective that would be today, right? You don't have to search too hard on the internet to find stories of churches that have been destroyed by leaders who've used the position for ill-gotten gains and immoral reasons for dishonesty. Leaders who are never in the kingdom of God in the first place. The enemy's going to try and attack the leadership, try and take over. And then in verses 4 and 5, uh, the enemy's going to try and attack th- the people. Just, you know, the ordinary, everyday folk who are part of God's kingdom. Do you see? The people's around, you know, the enemies uh, set out to discourage the people of Judah, make them afraid to go on building. You know, to... to to distract, discourage, frustrate the people in general. They grind them down till there's no energy left. And look, do you ever feel like as a Christian, it's 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 just hard work, isn't it? You've tried talking to your mates and colleagues about Jesus, but no one listens. There there are many ways in which life is harder because you're a Christian. The, The constant battle against sin Oh, it'd just be so much easier if you just gave in to temptation and just had a break, wouldn't it? You know, trying to hold on to you know, views in sexual ethics that the world says are outdated and bigoted when you know, trying not to offend people, it's, it's exhausting. The church in the, this country is such a minority thing now. We're not even mentioned in the news when restrictions are brought out for lockdown, we don't talk about churches in public. We, we, wouldn't it just so much, be so much easier if we stopped trying? Do you ever feel that? Just being ground down, frustrated, discouraged. That's how the enemy's going to attack. Uh, and then the big section in this chapter, we see um, after attacking the leadership and attacking the people... What do God's enemies do? Well, they try and convince the ruling authorities that we're up to no good. By spreading lies and deceit, it's utter nonsense, the letter they write to Artaxerxes. But, I mean, we get three kind of accounts. They write in verse 6 to Xerxes, and in verse 7, a few guys get in touch with Artaxerxes, the next king. Um, and then there's a really big letter written uh, from, chapter eight, from verse 8 onwards a second letter to Artaxerxes, and look at the lies. Here, verse 12, the king should know that the people you sent back to Jerusalem are, are rebellious and wicked. Are they? Verse 13, the king should know if the city is built and its walls are restored, no more taxes, tribute, or duty will be paid. Really? How do you know that? You're just making it up. Verse 14, since we're under obligation to the palace and it is not proper for us to see the king dishonored. Do you really care about dishonoring the king? You know, search the archives, verse 15. In these records, you'll find the city is a rebellious city, troublesome to kings and provinces, a place with a long history of sedition. Well, you'll find some stuff, but if that's all you go looking for, uh, do you see the kind of the way that the, the attack comes? Convince the ruling authorities that these guys are up to no good. You know, what does our government think about Christians and churches in general? Well, you know, they're not at the point of permanently closing us down yet. But there are plenty of groups out there lobbying to restrict our freedom, aren't there? And they don't tell the truth. How often do you read a story in the paper on the internet where you think, oh, that, that's not right? You know, it possibly won't be too long before the content of our sermons will be monitored for hate speech. Absolute truth claims that discredit other religious beliefs may well become illegal at some point. I could go on. You can see, can't you, how the enemies of God will twist the ruling authorities' opinions of what we believe for their own ends. They'll attack the leaders, the people, and convince the ruling authorities that we're up to no good. There has always been opposition to God's kingdom growing. And so I guess we're left asking the question, why? 
I mean, we know it's great news, don't we? God's kingdom is, is the best news. You know, God's kingdom growing is, is, is everything. It's the whole game. It's, it's life-changing. Why so much opposition? Why don't people want to join in? Why do folk want to stop what we're doing? Why will we face opposition? Well, we need to realize you know, that other people are not the issue. Other people are not the problem. You know, we know from Ephesians 6 that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms, says Paul. You know, there's always been opposition to God's kingdom growing, and we need to remember that Satan is behind it all. It all comes from him. The battle we're in is a spiritual one, not a physical one. How does Satan get people to follow him and carry out his plan? Well, it lies. Like it's been doing since Genesis 3. The same ones. Did God really say that? Does he mean that? You know, he, he just wants, he just, he just knows that if you do that, you'll be like him. And he, and he wants to keep him for yourself. He wants to be in charge. You know, Satan has forever been trying to convince people that we can be king of our own lives. That we don't need God, that we can be like God. That we don't need him. Like, I wonder if that's you. Are you holding on? Are you trying to be in control of your own fate? Is the barrier to you becoming part of, the God's, of God's kingdom the fact that you, you want to be in charge? That you want to be in control? That you want to be the master of your own destiny, your own fate? You don't want anyone else telling you what to do. Maybe it kind of feels like it's working so far. Maybe you're you're happy there. Well, well, consider this. Ezra 4 is not the end of the story. It's not even the end of the book of Ezra. As you already said, come back next week and you'll see God's enemies fall short and God's plan come to fruition. But, That may be true. Your God's plan will come good. But I think we're left here this morning as we close. How can we possibly stand in the face of this opposition? As we think about church planting, as we launch a new ministry plan, as we try to see God's kingdom grow now, how can we stand in the face of this opposition? How can we possibly keep going as we head into this year? How do we make sure that we do not grow weary and we don't lose heart? Well, the writer of the Hebrews says this. He says, consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Hebrews 12, 3. Consider him who has endured such opposition. How do we stand firm? How do we keep going? Well, it's not about bucking our ideas up. It's not about trying to be strong enough. It's not about trying to win the battle on our own. We go to Jesus. When we are wearied by the battle, we go to the one who has already won the war. We go to him who has already done it. He has endured the opposition, everything that Satan could throw at him. <coughs> Satan thought he had won on Good Friday, but on Sunday the tomb was empty. Satan was in fact the orchestrator of his own downfall. Jesus rose from the dead and defeated Satan, defeated death. And so we cling to him for our future. It is in Jesus that our future is secure. Nothing can touch us. King Jesus has already won. 
so we can face what Satan will throw at us. Not because we are strong. Not because we have things sorted. Not because we have the answers, but because Jesus has done it. He's already won. How do we react when we see these words in Ezra 4? How do we respond when we see the reality of trying to live first for God's kingdom? Do we lose heart? Do we grow weary? No. Ezra 4 is not here to put us off. It's not here to scare us. It is a reality check, yes but it is here to drive us to the one who has already won. Let's pray as the band come up. Father, as we head into this week, next week, the coming year, Father, we know that living faithfully for you is hard and we will encounter opposition. Father, help us not to be surprised by that, but help us not to despair. Help us to run to Jesus. Father, help us to hold on to our King who has already won who has endured such opposition already and has come through for us. Father, drive us to him, we pray. Amen.